Welcome, 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 one and all, to yet another episode of Wick TV. Today is call-in day. It's a very community-oriented experience where you, dear viewer, you, yes you, can call in and talk to me and my guest for the day about whatever it is you'd like. And today's guest is the one, the only, often imitated but never duplicated, Brittany Simon. How are you today? Great. How are you guys all doing? Hello. Thank you for inviting me. I felt very honored. I was like, oh, Wick wants me on a call-in show. I was very excited. Of course. of course. I enjoy our back and forth, even when we fight, even when we disagree. Even. I think it's interesting to talk to you, and I think you have an interesting message uh, to share with the class, right? Um, Thank you. Just to be clear today, we're going to stay away from some of the more personal drama shit, right? But if you have questions on uh, just general interactions right how we interact with our audiences or how we interact with other streamers in a general sense i think that's more than okay for sure um i did want to ask do you have any resolutions for this new year you're talking about 2024 starting out <laughs> great uh can you elaborate a little bit yeah so i decided that my 2024 you know resolutions are difficult because a lot of people make them and break them so i try not to make like hard ones so this year i'm focusing on the word like lifestyle mostly through my content and in my own life like what is the lifestyle that i want to live because you know we get so bogged down in working and just doing the everyday and paying our bills that we forget to also have a lifestyle so i was thinking like you know i've been on this minimalist kick or i've been on this focus of just like not attaching myself to possessions or, you know, just focusing on my work, but not letting my like family uh, connections deteriorate because of that. I'm in my hustle era right now. It's going great. Work is up. Everything is beautiful. But it is when you're working seven days a week and you're focusing on it, you, things can slip away from you. So I'm trying to think about what's the lifestyle I want to live while I'm in my hustle era, you know, because this job is just like, you know, I want it to last, but it means it needs like full attention. And so it can be like a weird balance. So that's my Goal for 2024 is, okay, manage the balance and make sure that I'm also communicating to the people I love, like, hey, I need you to respect the fact that I'm in my hustle era, but also, if you really need to talk to me, let's make a day in time. But also, I'm not going to, like, always have the, th I'm always, I'm not going to prioritize, like, I'm not going to have enough downtime to think I should call somebody. So because I don't have the downtime, I need you guys to make the effort, which is a big ask of family and friends, especially it when they're, you know, yeah. it's a big ask. So this year, lifestyle. What's the lifestyle I want? Oh, man, that's a good question. When I think of lifestyle, right, I mm -hmm. think of um, just routine, um, how you live day to day. And honestly, I like where I'm at routine wise mm. i work from home i'm able to have time to enjoy my hobbies i'm not uh i'm not rich by any means but i have enough to to put food on the table and uh take a vacation every now and again so when i think of lifestyle i don't know oh man if i maintain it probably a poor goal right just to maintain what i got mm. but uh if I can continue doing this, I'd be happy. I don't know. Yeah. My goal for every year is, hey, I want to be happy this year. I want to make sure that I stay um, above board, right, mentally. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to enjoy myself. Um, is that hedonistic? I don't know. But that's just how I think. No, so, I, I think it's realistic. I think it's more than reasonable to want that. I mean, I think if everyone had not only the minimal resources, but like just the ability to do it without shame. I think a lot of us would just be happy, like living a very simple life. We just want to be simple and happy and love the people around us and have a dog or chill or relax or have hobbies. Like, I don't think people are sitting around being maliciously, cruelly intent. Like, I don't think people want to be cruel. I think sometimes they feel like the world makes them that way. And so, I, you know, I would love to like live in a little world where people didn't feel pushed into a corner to do this and that they could just live like this simple life. You know, my partner and I talk about this all the time where regardless of how much money I eventually make, we always want to live off like the most minimal budget to live the most like not humble life, but live with humility, to live with gratitude, to be grateful that I can even do this full time, to be grateful that this is our life, to be grateful that we're not always chasing the Bugatti, right? I think it's a mistake to chase the Bugatti. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I had the money to mm. I would live more extravagantly than I do. Um I don't need help being humble. I need help uh 
when it comes to restraint. And what do I mean by that? And we have a caller. I'll get to you in a second. Let me finish my thought. But uh, yeah, this is a call-in show, gang. So please get in line. Um, when I get invested in something, when I get interested in something, when I start to enjoy a new hobby or a new uh, line of thing, I tend to get lost in it. I will devote more time than perhaps is reasonable mm -hmm. uh, to enjoying these things. So lately, I've been on a, I've rediscovered uh, Warhammer as a mm -hmm. hobby, right? And I've been on a kick delving into the lore, uh, delving into some, of, I've, I've even looked at some of the models and tried to get back into the tabletop game, right? Mm -hmm. I've always been, I, I still have some models from the fantasy game, but I've, I've never been really got into the sci-fi game. So I've been looking at that. But, uh, yeah, that's what I, again, if I had the money to it, I'd just do it. But uh, the restraint thing of, of, of my time, not the money, but the time yeah. is what I worry about sometimes. But let's bring on, before we get too far into this, let's bring on our first caller of the day, Small Peanut, and see what she has to say. Hello, you're live. Well, I actually have a question because you kind of hit what I was going to say. I, too, when I'm in something, oh, my hair's messed. I become heavily invested in something, right? So my issue is that for me, like when I get, I don't know if it's my ADHD or not, but when I get heavily invested into something, it takes away all my time and I have a hard time finding a balance between work and play. So what do you, how, I want to know, what do you think is the best way to maintain work and play? Mm, mm. Well, okay, this is what I do. So it might not work, but this is what I do for myself because like I, you know, <laughs> neurodivergent life here so what I do is I make a list every day of the things that have to get done have to then I make a list of everything that I want to get done and then I make a list of everything that I in an ideal world would get done but probably won't happen so I give myself an opportunity to let go of the attachment of getting everything done so like today I was like okay I have to do a photo shoot and I have to prepare for my live show. Anything else I do other than that is a bonus. So if I edit those photos, bonus. If I edit a video, bonus. But no matter what happens today, those are the two obligations I have because that will, you know, impact how the rest of my week goes or that will mm -hmm. impact my job. So for me, it's like give myself an opportunity to like fail at attempting my goals so I know like it's not the end of the world if that happens. You know what I mean? I also noticed that, well, right now I, I recently quit, I quit a job that I was working at where I was getting bullied because not dealing mm. with that. Mm. <laughs> um, oh, you and quit? So I'm, I didn't know you quit. quit. When did this happen? Um, Probably two weeks ago. So right now that I have more free time, I'm I'm finding myself doing, devoting myself more to play than work, which means finding a job and all that stuff. And I find that like when I'm home and I'm not working or anything, my other priorities go on the back burner. And it's mm. like the finding the balance between that is so difficult because it's I know I have stuff to do, but it's like, I just want to play my games. I just want to talk to my friends. Yeah, I think that's so human, like how relatable, right? Like, I mean, you just want to do what you want to do that makes you happy. I think that's why it mm -hmm. is always about like not beating yourself up if you weren't perfect, but making sure that mm -hmm. you're being a responsible adult and doing the basics of what's needed. And then also remembering that like you have a short time on earth and it's okay to spend it playing games. Like you're not, you know, that's okay. That's a good thing to spend your time doing. It's all about that balance. But I think what's so important is like, don't beat yourself up. Just have a better relationship with yourself. Cause I think shame can play such a huge role in people enjoying their lives. It's like you're, sometimes they shame you for like enjoying your well, life. Family might too. Like my family will be on my ass about getting the job and stuff, and I'm like, I'm telling them, yep, I'm at, like because before like my last job, um, I had a really bad, I went to a really bad spot of depression during mm -hmm. COVID, and so funny, I just didn't work at mm -hmm. all. I I became um agoraphobic for a little bit, mm -hmm. um, and I went to therapy, everything, got that all solved. But it's my family was on my ass about getting a job now, getting a job back then. But it's like now that like I'm not as agoraphobic and everything like that, like I feel I don't know more motivated to do it because I'm like, listen, I like the money that was coming in. You know, I like having that extra money that I can do stuff with. And I like being away from Discord where I can go hang out with my family because I also like if there's Discord stuff, it's like it's just drama and you get like so encapsulated in it and it's like not worth it. It's not. Um, Brittany's playing good cop. I'll play bad cop a little bit for this. Um, <laughs> yes, I think Brittany is correct, but I would stress like 
however you feel about it, we do live in a society or in a system where we have to we have to work to eat. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to make the bills. Uh, you have to pay the bills because if you don't, if you put it off too long, if you procrastinate and kind of let it slide, it makes it much harder mm -hmm. to dig yourself out of that pit. Right. It's a very slippery slope mm -hmm. of, of debt mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. financial burdens. And if you want to stay out of of that kind of uh, debt, which which is a huge burden, it's a shackle. Uh, yeah. You do have to kind of keep ahead of it. So I can I can understand where it would be annoying to have your family all the time riding your ass. Well, now about they're it, like... not as bad as they used to mm -hmm. because I've personally like I I think also going to therapy. Going I suggest yeah. therapy for people who don't go to it. Therapy is great. People say it doesn't work. It does work. You just have to be committed to it to want to try it. My opinion. Um, but going to therapy and like getting that motivation, like I made myself this year a deadline. Like I said before February, you need to at least have interviews. Go to places, have maybe jobs line up, and I've already like done that. I've gotten interviews. I've already like maybe gotten positions secured. So like having that motivation and that deadline has so has helped me so much right. than prior in the past where I was like you know stuck in that rut. So I feel like also if setting deadlines, great mm -hmm. to do. I like and as someone who has ADHD and whose mind just goes crazy, mm -hmm. having those deadlines in front of you makes it so much easier. So. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with Wick too. Like, obviously, it's about balance. Ultimately, like, we do have to adult and we have to manage how to survive in the world. But also, it's about it's, it is about that. But ultimately, that balance. But I'm congratulations on therapy working. I know it's a tool that's complicated, and I'm glad that it worked for you. If uh, there's an um, old cliche, right? Um, if you don't, if you if you uh, fail to plan, you plan to fail, and I think that's true. Mm. Uh, you have to have something to work towards some sort of structure yeah. just winging it might work for some it's not worked for me in general mm. right yeah I, <laughs> it, it it just doesn't and and i can see by your your uh agreement here that it probably didn't work for you either but it sounds like you do have a plan it sounds like you do have yeah. some structure that's good uh stick to it like in working out people like to have accountability buddies this might be helpful to you uh, when it comes to looking for work. Have an accountability buddy, someone that whose whole job is to make sure that you're sticking to what you said you would do, to keep you honest, if you will. But uh, is there anything else you got for us? Any other uh, things you want to ask about or talk about or any other thoughts or opinions? Um, can I ask about the Jew tunnels? The Jew tunnels. Oh, does Brittany know about the Jew tunnels? I do know about that. I did see yeah. that. So this, is the, so this is the funny part, right? I'm Jewish, right? And so my mom grew up in Brooklyn, right? So she knows the Hasidic Jews in the in you know New York City, right? And she said, "What the fuck are they doing in these tunnels?" I showed my dad the video of the guy coming out of the grate, and he just laughed his ass off. He's like, "What the fuck is going on?" And then I'm hearing a bunch of shit like they did it for COVID to do like expand their synagogue i'm like who's listening to prayers underneath the fucking tunnel in the synagogue it's just so much stuff and then i saw and then my boyfriend came to me and he was like hey babe do you have any jew tunnels and i'm like are you seriously going to me he's just cracking jokes at me about it mm -hmm. and it's funny but at the same time it's like then they also hear the cop they're like well they wouldn't if the cop they wouldn't have fought the cops if they didn't do anything bad and i'm like Hey, you may have a point, but at the same time, you never well, know. How do you guys feel about this in comparison to Tunnel Lady? Do you guys know Tunnel Lady? Look, What's there's tunnel a lot lady? of tunnel stories. You're going to have to be more specific. And on TikTok, the woman who's building a tunnel underneath her home. Do you guys not know this? Oh, my God. I'm on that side of TikTok. I, no. I don't. Okay, don't. there is a woman it's who's funny. also digging a tunnel underneath her home and the authorities finally got involved because obviously she like compromised the foundation of her home in her neighborhood. Yeah. But it, it's this idea of people feeling, I'm going to say the word, entitled to like doing things that might drastically affect their neighbors. So I thought it was weird that a religious community would do that, though I'm not surprised. And then same with this individual woman. It's like, girl, did you not consider your neighbor's foundation or the neighborhood or the plumbing of the neighborhood or anything that has to do with anyone else but your home? It is so a it is kind of interesting. There was yeah. a there was a story and I I, I, I wish I, I remember the details. I think it was in Virginia, maybe it was in North Carolina, about there they found this tunnel system and they were like there was a, a, a big to-do of what is this tunnel system for? There's no 
records. There's no blueprints. There's no, like, what was it built for? And when it came out, right, after a long investigation, it turned out there's this, just this dude who liked to dig. <laughs> and he had been digging for years. And that's what he did as a hobby. I think people just like to dig, okay? Yeah, maybe. I think people just like to dig tunnels, okay? They would rather dig tunnels than go to therapy. I don't know, but that's what they're doing. Um, maybe. That's my thoughts on that. Maybe that's their special interest. If I could build a tunnel right now, I would be building a tunnel, right? I'm, I'm building sure. a tunnel to you, dear viewers' hearts. That's what I mean. <laughs> but uh, Small Peanut, thank you for calling in. Bye, guys. Have Bye. a good one. Bye. Let me bring on our next caller. We got Mooncake. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask a question. It's probably random to the topic we have now. Um, but There's no uh, topic. You can ask whatever you want. You were the you were the topic today, Mooncake. Okay, okay. Um, I was talking to a few people in uh, this Discord the other day, and we, well, the few people were men, um, and we actually got into a discussion, and they were trying to convince me that the reason why men I guess should be having more sex or why they're kind of like entitled to sex is because it's like in an eight in innate need like animalistic type need um and I was just curious of I guess your thoughts on that because like that's what they were trying to convince me of so they were saying to just to be clear that men like literally need sex that it was an animalistic urge or yes. drive that they couldn't live without yeah basically yeah like need like food and water need that's that's how it seemed they were trying to compare it to. I think some people feel that way. Uh, I would argue it's a feeling because they lack discipline and they're not having an introspective relationship with themselves. But I also know some people have higher sex drives and needs compared to others. I recognize that people could be ace or demi or different and not everybody has an inherent desire to have sex or has a sex drive in that particular way, though I can understand people who might. But I could, I, I think in a planet of 8 billion people, there's probably a group of people that feel that way and are having a real experience. The question is why? And then the question is, what can we do about it? And then the question is, do they understand that this requires somebody else to join in or can they just solo experience Take matters it? matters in their own hands, so to speak. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I guess like what my questions were would be like, like when I hear need, it's something like you live or die, like with or without, right? So when they say like need sex, I'm like, okay, I don't think you would die from a lack of sex. Um, and then they also try to speak about like having kids and how like I guess every man wants to have children, just something like that. Um, and then my question to that was basically like, do you think every person has the right to procreate? So just because you want to, like. Do you think they have the right to have children? Uh, just because are, are you want children? to, um, you have to have a willing partner. Okay, this isn't something that you can just. <laughs> I think that people take having kids too lightly. Mm. I think for a lot of people, they they see it as an accessory uh, to their lives. I think that is a very wrong way to go about it. I think that people who feel like the world they deserve. X, Y, or Z from the world mm. are going, they're, they're heading for disappointment. Mm. Um, it's just not something that you what, deserve is such a weird word to use in this. Yeah. Case. So yeah. is need. Okay. okay I get that too. people really like having sex. Everyone does. Okay. Well, not everyone, but a lot of people do. I get it. Yeah. And they can feel like, oh man, I really need that ice cream or I really need that snack. You don't. You can we have to learn restraint, Kang. We have to learn restraint as men. I can't speak for you women, but for men, restrain yourselves. Restrain your urges. You don't have to. Just because you feel something doesn't mean you should act on it. I don't know. That's my thoughts. What are your thoughts, Brittany? I actually do agree with you on the kid front. I do. You know, I take it really seriously as one of 10 myself. Um, I just think it is such a big deal to bring a brand new consciousness into the world and be like, congratulations, you get to pay taxes now. Like, I think that's great to want to have kids. And I think it's beautiful when you're a great parent. I think most parents, if I'm going to be honest with you, um, with without intending to do end up causing a lot of dysfunction and toxicity and abusiveness probably in their children or like in their child's environment. They don't mean to, right? We're all like little monkeys on a planet and we all understand what we understand because we're born into like little cultural bubbles and then we're taught that this is how you treat kids and then we realize, oh, maybe we should have done it that way. So I'm not pointing fingers. 
I just think yeah. that it's a pretty serious matter to bring a child into the world and then recognize like breaking generational curses is difficult. Um, but again, going back to that deserve word, I don't like entitlement in people. I think it's like a big ick. So when you feel entitled yeah. to people's like bodies and love and everything else, it's like, well, I'm not the biggest fan of that narrative. And I do think when you say all men want to be fathers, you're discounting a lot of people on the planet who don't desire that. And I think it's unfair to them um, to like have to question their manhood because they don't want to have kids. Like having a kid is also about being yeah. a parent and not everybody wants to be a parent. Lots of people want kids though. And I'm not okay with that. Like, so I guess uh, further to that, um, how would I address like, because mm, obviously I think, I don't know, like it's a bit complicated. I'm wondering how to address these situations where people like say that they deserve, like, as I was mentioning, like the sex or like children or like these instances like, specifically with men. And do you think the red pill has made it worse? Well, yeah, I guess it would depend on the context. Are they telling you, hey, have sex with me, I deserve it? Or are they just saying it in a Discord call somewhere? Um, well, we were just, like, discussing. So we were having a back and forth just about, like, sex and relationships. And this is what, like, they truly believed. Is that, like, they are deserving, no matter what, of these things. Look, I, I mean, I just call them on it and call them stupid. But that's me. I don't know. Brittany might, I, might do better here. Well, I think there's always going to be a part of the population um, that that entitlement is actually like one. I'm going to say the T word. It sounds trauma based to me, bros. But obviously, it's education as well. And it's a misunderstanding of science. I think that's the biggest issues because none of us are experts. Like I'm not an expert in anything except myself. But it is difficult because you hear this thing like we're animals and we're meant to procreate. And then people think that that's all you are is your biology. But what you are is a biological organism that's evolved over millions of years to create this like genetic anomaly that is actually so capable of thinking that you can have a better, more disciplined relationship with those urges slash desires, which I think are not necessary for sustaining human life as individuals. And then you can make the larger argument about sustaining the planet with the human species, which I don't think is an obligation we have morally. I think I don't believe in objective morality. So these men would have to first ask themselves, why do you have this answer for yourself? Who gave it to you? Then they'd have to ask themselves, like, why do you think because this is your answer that you now deserve this thing? And then what do you do when it comes to not attaining that goal? What is the repercussions for everyone else if you don't get what you claim you deserve? And then are you a threat to society because you're not getting it? Because – you know, there's that narrative that Jordan Peterson shares, which is when men aren't given companionship, they can take a horrible turn into violent destruction on people. And the dilemma is like, are you saying men are a threat to me if they don't end up having companions? Because that is not a narrative I think men would appreciate in terms of their reputation as a gender. That sounds like a bad reputation as a gender to say, like, if men aren't given like partners they're going to turn violent right i think men are better than this so i would tell these men you should be better you should be better i um, don't I, suck, I, I, man. maybe not maybe not like that suck. but like okay I've, I've, uh, tried to avoid going that route just because i'm trying to be i guess more um I, i'm trying to understand their perspective but it's it's a difficult perspective to understand um being that like i would agree with you guys i don't see it as a like you deserve this right um and I guess part of my concern is that like the red pill is doing unimaginable damage uh, to young men specifically. And, or is this just like a male issue? It's, it's a look, there are a lot of things going on in the world right now. Wick opinion come in pot, right? So disregard it if you'd like, but I think that it's not just the red pill, but it's our response to the red pill and that, that uh, tension that is causing much of this problems because we have a tendency and this isn't just within gender dynamics this this happens all across the spectrum in terms of any contentious topic any kind of topical uh thing that's being discussed um people have a tendency to if the, the side that disagrees with them just to discount them completely and i think that's wrong because red pill does bring up some actual issues and if we continue to simply just discount all of it because they come to some whack ass conclusions it's yeah. to our detriment and it's not going to help so yes the red pill has done some bad shit but i think our response to the red pill is exacerbating the problem we need to stop 
um, making it us versus them. We need to stop um, saying that they're lying when men feel like that they're not uh, being heard or not being valued anymore. I think that we need to acknowledge the actual issues at play and be honest with uh, the people around us. So I think it's very fine when you're talking to your friends online to acknowledge that, hey, I think you're going through it right now. I think I could, I feel your pain kind of deal, right? Do it less yeah. cringy. Um, <laughs> make sure it's in context. But uh, kind of go with them and try to just help them take what's pro bothering them and lead them down better paths with it. I don't know. That's just me. Um, I, I, uh, I don't mean to drag this on, but like what, uh, what red pill points do you think like red pill got right? You don't mind okay. Me. So I think men are being devalued in society right now. Um, I think that there's a lot of people who don't take men's issues seriously, uh, domestic violence against men, rape against men, all these things, uh, sexual assault against men in general is just not taken as seriously as it is with women. Mm. Okay. Okay. I think that's relatively fair. Um, I think the problem I'm going to have and will always have with communities mm. is the narrative that men will say, like if you listen to Fresh and Fit, they'll say, you know, nobody cares about men's feelings while saying like they don't have feelings. And I'm like, which one is it? Do you have feelings or do you not have feelings? And the dilemma is they'll say like, I never get angry. I don't have emotions. Women have emotions. And I'm like, well, can't care for your feelings if you don't have them. So first men have to admit they have feelings. Then they'd have to be vulnerable. Then they'd have to accept the help that was given to them. But women have been fighting for this. Genders have been fighting for this. Men have been fighting for this. We're always going to keep fighting ourselves, like Wick was saying, until we accept, like, everyone's having a real experience. The question is, how do you dig deep enough to know why it's happening for real, real? Because we can always assign the why. But if we're not honest about why it's happening, then we're not yeah. really having the same conversation, right? So, again... I think this is cultural. We're all born as different cultures around the world and we're taught different things about what it is even to be a man or be a woman. There's different yeah. qualifiers. And so I would ask these men like questions. Dr. K always says like ask people questions. Just ask them questions until they unravel the truth for themselves. If you don't want to point it out, mm -hmm. ask them until they unravel it for themselves and ask it genuinely because you said you wanted to know why, yeah. how they think. Be curious so they can be curious. That's a good idea. I actually didn't think maybe of just asking like more questions to them, maybe just to figure out where this stems from. Um, I guess like where I was coming from, especially with the red pill community, is that I just feel like it's a lot of men taking advantage of other men. Um, and mm -hmm. it's like, how do we help the men who are being taken advantage of? Right. Like, how do we get it through to them that these men are also doing you a disservice. Here's the question. Why? First of all, not my battle, not fighting that battle, but <laughs> I would leave that up to probably other men because they don't want to hear from women. Mm. So I would leave that up to other men to fight for those men. I would trust more adjusted, like Jordan Peterson is trying to do his best to counter the Andrew Tate bubbles, right? He's trying to do his best to counter the Andrew Tate movement. I think that's reasonable. Ab and Preach are trying to counter uh, Fresh and Fit. I love Ab and Preach's content lately has been fucking so good, so introspective, yeah. so thoughtful. And I think that we see the growth in them. If you go back and watch Ab and Preach from five, six, seven years ago, they would have been like Fresh and Fit, but they're not because they've grown out of that stage. Even when Abba was doing collabs with Fresh and Fit, he could tell like something's weird about these guys, bro. And then eventually realized like, oh, I don't want to be associated with these guys. Like I would refer to those men to better men so they can say hey, you have other options than this particular movement, you know? Yeah. So what you're basically saying is that like they'll probably listen. Well, they would listen more if it's other men like explaining this to them. They're not going to listen to right. women, which probably they're already not. in like. Yeah, yeah, I, I tried to fight battles I can win, you know? Yeah. yeah, I, yeah uh, I would be, um, I'm going to push back on that a little. I don't think you should quit the field on this, Brittany. Mm. Um, I think that uh, while, yes, there will be people who just won't listen to you. That's true. Yeah. Um, you could reach more than you think by just being reasonable, um, mm. a, a reasonable person. We need more reasonable voices in the room, gang. Yeah. Um, and the fact that we don't have them because people get blackpilled because they feel like they, they can't convince anyone or they're not very persuasive. A, a lot of reasons, right? That they, they quit the yeah. field. Um, I, I would push back against that. I think that while, yes, you may not get anyone today, what you're doing is you're planting seeds for tomorrow. And you may not see 
the results of this, uh, uh, you may not sow, right? You may not sow any of this. Or I'm sorry, reap any of the benefits mm-hmm. here. But the sowing is what you need to do. You need to be that person that when they think back, man, are all women crazy? Oh, no, wait. I had this really reasonable conversation with Mooncake about my issues, and she took me seriously. So when they say all women are crazy, I don't know if that's true. And this plants a seed of doubt in their mind that can, again, sprout. Won't always happen, but I think that you need to do that. You need to always be willing. Like people say, it's not my job to educate you. No, that's not true. It is. It's all of our jobs to be a uh, a beacon on the hill, if you will. Be an example. I think I, I really do believe that. Maybe you disagree. I don't know. I don't think anything else a, for us? Yeah, I don't think oh, you have a moral ahead. obligation to that, but I do think, because I don't think anything is objective in that way, but I do think it's nice. I, I will say if you have the spoons and the energy and you're willing to do it, of course, like, of course, be good representation, but also like, you know, you're an animal on a planet evolved over time. You're going to die, bro. Relax. <laughs> That's for yourself. I'm immortal. I'm never going <laughs> to die. Um, Mooncake, is there anything else you got for us? Um, Any other no, questions? no, that was everything. I just wanted to uh, hit you with a little, little so, some few oh, questions. Thank you for calling in. Really of course. You. Thank Bye. you for answering the questions. Bye. Okay. Hi. <laughs> I'm at the gym, so I'm sorry for. <laughs> no need to apologize. You working out good today? You getting strong? Yeah, it's going to rock climb with my friend in a bit here. Um, I wanted to chat with Brittany about uh, the macro and the micro, and of course, Wick, your opinions on this. Um, I know, Brittany, you like to talk about the macro um, as being the most consequential. Um, and have you seen the Scale of the Universe website? No, I haven't. Okay, let me see if I can link it in the chat here. Um, uh, you probably wait. can't put it in the pit chat, but if you want to DM it to Brittany in or the, me, I Oh, own. yeah. Yes, let me try to do that. So there's a good reason um, we don't then, let people put links in here. He, oh, that is totally it. fair. Let me go ahead and message Brittany. Um, but basically, um, I'll send it in a bit, kind of harder on my phone. Uh, basically, humans, if you look at the scale of the universe, are more on the macro side of the spectrum than the micro. If you scroll through the website, you can be scrolling much fur- further into the micro, into planks, into, you know, uh, quarks, etc. cetera, than you will scrolling to the whole observable universe as we know it. Um, and so I was wondering if when you are talking about we only exist on the micro, are you conflating existing with being a co- inconsequential? Say it again. So when you say we don't exist on the macro, are you essentially just saying that we are I- inconsequential to the picture of the macro? Mm. Versus because to me, I mean, maybe I'm just, I'm too like very bio and science brained. Mm -hmm. So when I think of existing, I know the cells in my body exist. I know like there's arachnids on my face and in my eyelashes. Um, And, but not all of them are consequential to my existence, right? Mm -hmm. Um, When we're in a lab, we count cells, we verify their existence, we see their existence, but they may or may not be consequential. And so I wonder if, like, whether it's like a semantics issue or if you are literally saying we don't exist. So I'm not literally saying we don't exist. I'm saying in a metaphorical sense, it's necessary to understand the perception you're having outside of yourself by recognizing that you're not even observable through a certain lens. Like you said, all those like creepy crawlies we have all over our skin aren't observable to us, like just here with the like naked eye. But I know they're there, even though that freaks me out. I know they're there. But that's the point is that they we to the universe are not even observable. And yet we are so a part of it. We're like recycled energy. We're atoms. We're all these things, you know, hitting up against each other. And I think in order to be introspective and to humble yourself, even though we get stuck in our egos, even though on the micro we're doing like, you know, we're YouTubers and like, look at me and pay attention to my Patreon and all this. Also zoomed out, we're just a you know a little ingredient in the soup that's unrecognizable. So it's sort of beautiful. It's not to say that we're meaningless. It's to say that we're so inconsequential to the universe. We have so much more power and freedom to engage in our place in it. 
You know, it's to give ourselves power and to humble ourselves in the eye of the universe. Yeah, I think I think it was a language issue for me. I like inconsequential better than not existing just because I take it very literally. So that's just my totally. yeah, I don't know if um I don't know if I agree on the inconsequential even. Um so I'm maybe this is a hot take. Macro doesn't matter at the end of the day. Why would it matter to me what the human humanity as a whole does or does not do, right? Like how humanity this is some of the, the the problems we run into when we look at like too much data from a, a bird's eye view, from like God's view, uh, so to speak, is we can miss the real issues that people are having when you zoom in and closer in. We had an immigration debate yesterday. This is the same issue. People will say, yes, it's good for the economy overall. And nationally, that's very true. But when you zoom in to lo the localities, it can be a very different story. And so while it might be great for the overall economy, for the micro, uh, if you will, it can have some real issues. So for me personally, it doesn't really matter how humanity is doing. Uh, and, and this may be a selfish view on it, but I only care about what I can affect, right? What I can influence and what directly influences me. And other than that, it's not something that's on a high order of my priorities. I don't know. What do you think? Oh, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, I think that I, I somewhat agree with that in that just as I am inconsequential to the macro, the macro and the micro, the more micro micro, of, is inconsequential to me as well sometimes because sometimes you know there's viruses and stuff oh, sure, sure, inconsequential sure, yeah. right yeah. um i i think but i think the conclusion we can come to is the same right that mutual inconsequential <laughs> inconsequential anyway you get what i'm trying to say that mutual being inconsequential um to each other um is something that I think is important to acknowledge so that as Brittany says that we can stay humble and know like our place within the universe, right? Because tomorrow or whenever the crunch event of the universe or the big, there's the big crunch or the big, uh, it can heat up or the big freeze or whatever, whenever it happens, poof, we're gone. Nobody even knows the death of the universe, <laughs> we existed, right? right? Yeah, the death of the universe or the death of, death of Earth, the death of our sun, doesn't matter. There could be also like other things that just happen on Earth um, or, you know, humans, we can kill ourselves and all the animals here ourselves if we wanted. Um, a, lot, but, a lot of really positive vibes, but go ahead. <laughs> I, it's neutral vibes for me. If we die, we die. But <laughs> um, if... Um, I guess, like, I think you can come to the same conclusion whether you find, because I think it's natural, right? We as humans, we're going to prioritize our own species. We are animals. We're going to be like, what is the well-being of our species? And that's fine. And I think, like, it's still, like Brittany said, if you want to reach a different level of introspection, it's good to just realize that that's what we are, like, evolved basically mm -hmm. apes just walking around with thumbs and technology and all of that stuff, um, which I think is pretty cool. I like it. It's, it's very, um, I know some people don't like this when we had our good and evil panel, but I really like relating myself to mammals and other living organisms and seeing how are we alike and how are we different. Yeah, I think ultimately the reason why my work is centered around acknowledging whether – like what scope are we viewing our lives is because like if you do stay in certain bubbles, obviously your macro is as far as like your country or the international global crisis. But if you expand out into the universe, then you realize like all of these things are constructs and we're putting more pain into the world because we're not paying attention to the fact that we're inconsequential to the universe. So we think our egos get the better of us and we think now we can justify the torture and destruction of other human beings because – because we've convinced ourselves we matter to such an extent that we're allowed to discriminate against people's skin color or orientations or like agency. And I think if we acknowledge in a very humility philosophy sense 
that we are inconsequential to the universe, maybe we could start paying attention to in in which ways we are unnecessarily causing pain and destruction onto one another. Because like, why would I, if we're all born the same, if we're all the same, none of us chose our bodies or what we look like, then why would we even hold on to the constructs that like race matters or any of these things matter? Because we push them on one another and we force ourselves to pick sides, to look at good and bad, instead of looking at we're just a part of nature and everything we do is nature and including the destruction of our nature, like our destruction of our species could be a part of our nature or the fact that some guys aren't going to find mates in this lifetime because they didn't evolve to like spread their genetics. And like, that's just your life, my bro. But also like we are in, in so many ways starving for what Verveke would say is a meaning crisis because we're not paying attention to the fact that like, this thing you think that is so important, whether or not you have a nose job or whether or not Kim Kardashian's posting or whether or not like it is so your decision to make that the biggest part of your life. I try to look out into the universe so I can remember that like I can live a much happier and fulfilling mm -hmm. life by not making it my life. Go ahead. Do you do you think and this is a question to you, Brittany, but I'm, I'm curious what you think, uh, dear caller uh, whose name I don't know. Um, Arena. Uh, Aria? Arena. 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 OK. Um, to both of you. Do you not think that we have at least some duties as as existing beings um, to make either uh, the world around us or ourselves better? Do we not have any duty, any responsibility, any kind of, um, you know, uh, obligation? Uh, not in an objective sense. Like, I don't believe in objective morality or objective, like there's a objective. I just think that subjectively through my perception, Brittany's values, yes. But my values have different requirements from humans than other people's values. But I think it's subjective. Um, I, I, I would say inherently no, but I think as a species, um, or if we want to go smaller as a group as a tribe we can set such standards and that's where we get like cultures and ethics and that kind of stuff and then morals are personal but that doesn't come from ex like existence itself it comes from us and how you know we evolved as a species i think that there you are standards. Any less real though like just because it doesn't come from god no no no, no. i think it is real no 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 that, that, that's that's what i'm going to explain i think there's standards that each species, whether on instinct or whether on nurture, you know, nature, the whole nature versus nurture debate, I think that um, they set those standards, right? Like some animals are so, and I think especially for social animals like humans, um, there are, uh, I, I think it's vampire bats, correct me if I'm wrong, but if a bat is for some reason sick and can't go and get food, and another bat hoards all the food, the bats in the future will not share the food. Those bats have kind of as a collective decided what is the moral and um, socially acceptable thing to do. So, I, and that's real for them, right? But it's not like somebody, you know, it's not like the universe said that that's what they should do, but it is the best for their survivability, right? And so I think generally um, the obligation that we, or obligation that humans create is to ensure the survivability of our community. But when, I think when we look at the global, you know, population of humans, we just can't be in community with mm. that many people, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that, to your point, Not like you yet. were saying how- after, yeah. after technology, uh, well, social media has been a, a huge uh, upgrade into how many people we can have in our uh, community. That's true, but I don't think that's necessarily the healthiest. Yeah, I, I think that we're having yeah. troubles with it right now. I, I <laughs> yeah, agree with yeah. you. So. <laughs> um, is there anything else you have for us, uh, Miss Arena? Or, or no, nope, that that was all. Thank you all so much for having me. No, thank Bye. you. So there's a there's a saying in French, um, or at least a famous quote: uh, "Après moi, le déluge." After me, the flood. Um, this was said to uh, one of the. Uh, corrupt french kings when they were looking at some art or something and they were talking about like well oh, what are we gonna do we have all these problems going on like what's the future gonna look like and there is a philosophy out there that again i don't care what happens after i die i'm dead doesn't matter after me the flood can come swipe mm. us all away i don't give a shit right 
Um, and I don't know if that's a good thing. I think that it's probably wrong uh, to kind of think that way. I understand why a lot of people do, but uh, I I think this is one of our disagreements, Brittany, is there I think that there are moral obligations that people have to those around them and to themselves in order to make things better. And yes, there are limits on that. You shouldn't beat yourself up if you're not perfect on that. I agree with that, that. But yes, if you have the ability to help someone and you don't, I think that is a ding on you as a person. But, um. Yeah, I think I just... I. I don't think I think that's a beautiful sentiment, but I don't think it means anything because I don't know how to apply it to like real life. So I think that's the dilemma. Obviously, I think you should be a good community mean? member. But like when you say like if you don't help someone and you can, it's like, well, what does that mean? Like everyone can help someone it more than they're like doing. If you are if I see this happen all the time, like you'll be in a discord to call someone. Someone will be talking about how they're struggling and things mm. like that. You know, like that you have a little extra that. If you if you were really serious about helping them, you could you could surreptitiously apply to them. But we make excuses for this all the time for not to do. It. And I'm guilty of this too. To be clear, I am not perfect at this. I do this all the time, and it's a ding on me as a person. Where I think, well, no, that's just weird. Or um, mm -hmm. and I make all these justifications for why I'm not going to help this other person out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, that's wrong to do. And uh, yeah, that's change. interesting. I mean, I think it's valid. Obviously, like I think we all have different perceptions of what our morals are. That's what morals are. They're personal to us. Um, I think society has different ways it could run better. Like the ethics of society could be done differently. But in general, be a c good community member and then be thoughtful about what community you're in. Right, like. I'm in a different community now in Europe. I have a different standard of expectation of behavior. And so to be a good community member, I will adapt and I will, you know, I won't come here and be like, USA, USA. Like, I'm not in the USA anymore, girl. So I agree with you on that front. Sure. Be a good community yeah. member. No, uh, let's bring in the next caller. Okay, perfect. So my first question would be kind of, do you have any idea what enlightenment could be? That's super broad. Uh, what enlightenment can be? Are you talking about in a traditional sense? Like, are we talking about like in a Buddhist sense of enlightenment? What are we, uh, can, can you elaborate? Would you be interested in becoming enlightened? And like, what would you consider there? Like, do you want to become enlightened in a Buddhist sense or... Oh, ignorance is bliss, baby. Uh, I don't know if I do. Uh, <laughs> look, I I think that my instinct is to say yes if I could know and become uh, and see past the veil, if you will, right? See beyond and to be able to 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 grow as a consciousness. Yes, but I do worry that I'm not gonna like what what, what I see there, right? I I think that ignorance is bliss. I put that out like facetiously, but there is some truth to that. Like, I I don't know if I want to know for a hundred percent what everyone around me is thinking. Like, I think that could be a horror show in, in a real what a real sense. What do you think, Brittany? Uh, if you could be enlightened, would you uh, would you choose? To do it? Um, you know, I think enlightenment is somewhat possible but also impossible you know they say before enlightenment you carry water up a hill and chop wood and after enlightenment you carry water up a hill and chop wood and talk on streams and talk on streams so <laughs> like regarding what you said i think it's right it's like a transformative experience where maybe your epistemology or your values might change through the process so you really can't tell right now whether you would like it but then just going from like other descriptions, like in Buddhism, people are obviously like, oh no, enlightenment's like awesome. Like you feel content all the time. That sounds good, right? Yeah, uh, the, the lack of desire thing, right? I don't know. I understand this very Eastern kind of philosophy deal. I don't know if, if I buy that entirely. I can see some benefits to it, right? There is this, this, uh, this great thing where I have personally, it's like a ingrained thing where... I get interested in people if they're interested in me, but if there is no interest in me, I lose interest in them. And that's very helpful, right? It, it, it helps me out because if I'm not interested in them, I don't have this longing, desire, jealousy, etc. So that's super helpful. But at the same time, it can be good to want something and not get it. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Like even what you described there is sounds maybe not totally optimal like maybe that's 
some kind of okay, yeah, not trying for what you can't get or mm. something. I'm not mm. sure. Mm. And maybe that's like the same thing with enlightenment. You are like, okay, I can't get it, so I don't even want it. Uh, the opiate of the masses, if you will, right? Contentment is the death of ambition, um, and that's both a great and a terrible thing. Uh, mm. It really depends on the context, and it's, I know it's a, it's a sleazy answer, it's kind of a wishy-washy answer, but it's just true. Like, I, You shouldn't be content with certain things. There are certain things you should just not be content with. If you're in an abusive relationship, you shouldn't just be content with that, thinking that, oh, that's the best I can get, oh, this is, I should be happy with what I have, but at the same time, right, if you're so ambitious that, like, oh, I want a, someone who is a 10, a California, an LA 10, who makes a million dollars a year, at least, right, who's going to give me, uh, and pamper me, and do everything I want, I mean, then, dude, you're just setting yourself up for failure. Uh, you need to maybe tamper those expectations just a little bit. But maybe there's like a misunderstanding kind of what contentment there means and like what desire means, because maybe it's just seeing that you never existed. And so in that sense, the new you, which doesn't exist anymore, doesn't have desires. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Um, Would you? Uh, I, um, I, uh, man, look, I don't know. Uh, I think that we get this kind of Stockholm syndrome with who we used to be. Um, and a lot of people will say this, that, oh, I'm grateful for the experiences I went through because it made me into the person I am today. Uh, even the bad experiences that traumatized me and, and, and made me, uh, gave me all these neuroticisms and things like that. But I would be a different person, so I wouldn't want it any other way. No, there is objectively a better version of you that could have been had had you not gone through those huge trauma experiences and you wouldn't be a different person. You would have different values perhaps or, or different ways of, of different styles of behaviors, but those aren't necessarily going to be worse. In, in many cases, they could very well be better. So I don't know if I buy into the whole... Um, the whole oh uh, just because my values change or my behaviors change it means i've changed irrevoc irrevocably and uh that's that's bad i think it's good in a lot of ways maybe okay i could give you like one model of enlightenment and then which is kind of like Briefly. your mind creates like a virtual reality around you including a model of yourself and basically, by taking a very close look at reality, you can see how that model and that reality is created from some sensations. And then you can kind of see through that in some ways, and your mind flips over to like a different way of seeing the world, which is like more non-dual, less suffering, less stuff like that. Does that sound interesting? Oh, man, I don't know. Uh, I think if I could reverse it, yes. Can I try it? And if I don't like it, can I use that same process in reverse to go back? I mean, you could probably get some thing? glimpses of it, like by taking some drugs. Yeah. Oh, take some drugs and uh, see the world. Uh, I'm not. I'm not totally against the idea. Uh, maybe depending, right? Like, uh, but um, I don't know. I think that like anything that I need to become a like, if I need to continually take a substance to experience, I probably don't want to do it. No, no. The idea is because you wanted to go back, right? So drugs are, like, a great way to check something out for, like, a few moments or, like, some time. I have, like, a non-dual experience stop existing for some time and then go back to existing afterwards. And then you could be like, this was cool, this was interesting, and do some meditation and, yeah, figure that out. I fear that if I have the experience in a very easy way, that I'm not going to want to do the work to have it in the hard way, and I'm just going to continually go for the easy way. I think I know me, and that would be what I would do. Like, why work on all of this when I could just pay a few bucks and get some psilocybin and go at it, right? Um, I don't know. There are probably, like, some more deeper, more interesting experience, and you would, like, probably... I mean, at some point, if you take enough LSD, you will probably either go insane or become enlightened, or both. So. Or both. I love the both option. Um, friend, thank you for calling in.
Um, do you want to do you want a new experience? Because I'm going to give you a new experience. Go to the void. Wake and he the can wake. be in the void, experiencing Nirvana. A That's state of nothingness. so funny. He probably thought no it was game. hilarious. Knocking no, him out. He's like... Cool guy. I just I don't know how to engage with it on a on a format such as this, right? That oh, feels like sure. more of a conversation Mom. where we're on a porch, we're smoking, yeah. we're drinking, we're we're getting really uh in touch with nature. If you will, and we have this conversation, but like on a stream, I don't know. It's a it's a long conversation. It's a good one. You know, it kind of brings up that macro and micro again. But you're right; it's like a long yeah. form convo. But cool, 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 cool. <laughs> Any thoughts uh, from your end on that? Um, nope, that was very enjoyable, though. I liked. I just like the back to back like philosophy <laughs> questions. I appreciate that. No, I like philosophy. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I liked the macro micro stuff more. I think it was more digestible. Yeah, for but, sure. Yeah. Let's bring on our next guest. If there was an alien race that was better than humanity from a moral perspective. Nuke it from orbit. <laughs> anyway, carry on. Uh, would you, all selfish thoughts aside, push a button that eliminates humanity and saves the aliens? No. No. Okay. Well, yeah, why would I do that? That's me. I don't want to eliminate me. <laughs> like, yeah, but that's maybe this choice. is a selfish. Maybe this is a selfish thing, but I don't want to live in a world where I don't exist. Okay. Well, what if you could go with the aliens? Oh, and eliminate everyone else? Yeah, yeah. How hot are these aliens? Good question. Uh, let's say are they Star Trek aliens where you can fuck them, or are oh, they yeah, like yeah. Uh, still no, they're not like jellyfish people. Like jellyfish yeah uh no let's say like uh what are they called asaris from uh mass effect Just sorry sexy... sorry humanity you're gone <laughs> all <laughs> right that button leave with the sorry sex chicks yeah every time okay yeah and they're nicer people that that was the main point of the sure yeah <laughs> X, like i already said yes you don't have to sell me okay. on it more all jesus right. all right okay all right i appreciate I'm your answer. a little bit though no i in all seriousness, I wouldn't push a button that genocides all of humanity. It just wouldn't happen. There's no scenario okay. where that happens. Okay, gotcha. So. Yeah, um, my my personal morals says don't genocide and don't eradicate like any part of humanity and on mass. So if if they were a better moral superior society, then they wouldn't want to genocide. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah gotcha. What would you do? Would you push that button? I'd eliminate humanity because I I value goodness more than. Don't you think guess, goodness humanity? is a construct though? Like it doesn't even mean anything. It comes from your perception. Yes. yes. And I'm basing this off from my perception of what is good. Interesting, because my perception of what is good is not genociding, but you have genocide in your goodness. Well, that's the only choice. In the hypothetical, you can't save both of them. Oh, in the hypothetical, you can't save both of them. Yeah, you, so you have, have to pick to one to one live and one to die. It's like the trolley example, great, but with aliens. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, aliens I don't like the cooler. trolley one either. I'm kind of an indifferent person. I do nothing. I let nature take its course, but I think everything we do is nature. So whatever you choose, it was within nature. All right, I'll take it. Um. Got now, anything else for us, sir? Yes, yes. I had something specifically for Brittany uh, relating to personal responsibility when it comes to content creation. Yeah. So I'm, I want to dig into what level of per, uh, responsibility they have. And so uh, I wanted to bring up three things. So we have direct calls to action, strong stances on things, and more vague statements. So the examples I came up with was a direct call would be something like all people should disrespect police officers. Would you say that is like probably a bad thing to do for a content creator? Uh, probably not for a content creator, but within my value system, again, I'm probably like I'm pro less violence. So I would think that a call to violence is probably not necessary, but I could see a perspective in which somebody might be in a political bubble in which that would make sense to make that call for violence. Like, Obviously, if you're following like any conflict in the world, you're calling for violence if you pick a side. So I think it's kind of one of those dilemmas where I could see somebody being in that 
that world. But for me, my personal values, I think a call to violence is probably the wrong answer. Okay. That's a good answer. Uh, Wick, did you have anything for that one? Uh, I think that like encouraging people to dehumanize others or a group is probably bad. Don't do it. Okay. And now for strong stances, if a person personally said, the content creator said, I don't think police officers should be respected. Do you think that could have an impact on the audience? And would that be a good or a bad thing? They, they from call us influencers for a reason. Um, we do have influence on our audience and we should be uh, cognizant of that. So yes, I think that my statements can, to either a greater or a lesser degree, influences those that hear it. What do you think, Brittany? Yeah, I obviously think everything that we do, whether we're content creators or just people at our local church or people in our schools or people, I think we're always influencing. Ever seen a bumper sticker on a car? You know, people are always trying to influence one another. I think there is no harm, no foul to us influencing one another as long as we're ready to combat with good ideas or we agree as a society to have systems in place to maybe take people off platforms who might be advocating for the genocide of an alien race, you know, maybe that might be necessary. Um, I don't think people holding opinions, though, is inherently bad or evil. I think opinions are that person explaining to a perspective that they came to for a reason. And it's our job as a society to ask ourselves, how did this human come to that perspective? What tools were they given? How were they raised? What society were they born into, right? The world is complex and diverse. I'm not here to moralize diversity, right? I just want to have a conversation about how it's going to cause conflict, which is beautiful. Okay. Uh, but just to clarify, I might have missed it. You do think that would have an effect on the audience if somebody took a Yeah, I think everything we do have has an effect, whether you're in negative or positive. I think being overly positive about things could have negative or positive effects as well. So, yes, it would have a, an effect. Okay. And now what about a vague statement? Like just saying uh, – like. Uh, this kind of leans more into strong stances, but I, I couldn't come up with a better example on the fly. What if a person just said, you know, police officers suck? You're allowed to express your opinions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you think that would impact the beliefs or thoughts of the audience? I mean, Possibly. maybe. Okay. Probably to a, like a lesser extent, I don't, though. I, I think don't... that this was... Oh, go on, Brittany. Please. Well, I would say that I think it would reinforce... Or turn off people depending on what they – so if they come into it already thinking the same thing, they're like, yeah, that's what I oh, think. Yeah. Or if they don't agree, they're like, ugh, I hate this guy. He's saying the thing I hate from people. <laughs> so I think ultimately it would do probably about that. Vague statements probably do that. Or it makes people like – I'll make vague statements. So just like being a human. Like I'm not even doing it intentionally. And people will like run with it. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Like what do I do with this? Do I explain every vague statement I make? Or when I make a strong statement, like I remember one of the conflicts I was in as a content creator is I was making a lot of vague statements so I could be more like thoughtful of people's differences. And then people were like, Brittany, make a strong statement. And I was like, okay, here's a strong statement. They're like, not that one. And I was like, oh, <laughs> it was like people are not happy with whatever yeah. you do. And so it's necessary for you to form your own morals because morals are personal and then decide mm -hmm. how your morals are going to impact the ethics of society. Right. True. Don't let your audience hold you hostage. Right. I hate that. Um, I will say unless they give me money, gang, if you give me enough money, you can hold me hostage any day, but you're going to have to meet my price point. OK, it's non-negotiable. Um, I will say, though. You, you did that that vague question kind of brought up something. There are yep. certain phrases or terms people can use that instantly turn me off. Mm. Like instantly, I'm like, okay, I'm not listening anymore. Um, late stage capitalism is one of them. If I'm having a conversation and someone drops the late stage capitalism, I'm like, I stop taking that person seriously. <laughs> it's wrong to, right? Like I shouldn't do that, but it's just something I do. I'm like, okay, wow, this person is gone. And I can't engage with this anymore. Um, they oh, have yeah. just, uh, they are an ideologue in a way that I can't, I can't work with. Now, again, that's probably wrong to do. That's probably unfair to, uh, to do to them. Uh, but it is something that happens. Yeah. I think that happens in everybody's mind to an extent when it comes to specific things. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We all have like, look, especially if you consume content because you actually like it, you're going to consume content that allows you to get something positive out of it. And if you just hear the thing that annoys you, like how I don't like I don't hate watch nobody. I don't have time for it. My skin can't handle it. I refuse to do it. So for me, I always consume things that like I mostly would align with or agree with. Right. And then if I need a contrary opinion, I would seek out those, you know, environments. But 
generally speaking, like I usually watch people that sort of align with sort of my worldview. Mm hmm. Yeah, that um, makes sense. I if I wasn't doing this as a job, I probably wouldn't watch any of you. I'm not gonna lie. Um, hey, fair, uh, fair. I I I like to. Do, I'm an I'm not an observer. I'm a participant. Oh. The reason I got into this is so I because it was like oh, I, Prime Kai was doing an open panel, right? And I was like, oh, I can actually jump in and, and talk to people. Sold, right? But if you ask me to sit on the sidelines and just watch all the time, no, why? If uh, yeah, why would I do that? Like, if I if I want to, I want to. I don't want to listen to other people do it or see other people do it. I want to do it. So yeah, well, that's me. I mean, just listening is still a way to kind of challenge your thoughts and perspectives too. Mm, maybe, but it's not something I enjoy. So okay, fair. Yeah, that's um, fair. But thank you for yep. calling in. Yeah, that's all I got. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thanks. Genociding alien races. Ugh. I didn't know I was going to have to be asked to push that button. You know, some people think we're the aliens, Wick. So I'm a human supremacist. This is my mm. team, okay? If aliens come and they fight us, I don't care if they're better morally than I. I will fight back, okay? Okay. Unless they're hot enough. If they're hot enough, they can, you know, honey. Let's go. Yeah, you know, let's talk about it. Let's bring on a bring on the next guest. Well, I, t I got some things for you guys today. Um, why in this alien world are there no more safe spaces for men? We got Taylor Swift taking over football. Everyone's got to listen and watch her. Why can't men just enjoy their sports? What happened to manly activities with other men? What are manly activities with other men in this context? Oh, hugging and loving other men. I think they uh, still have bathhouses, so. In in a competitive environment where you score against each other. And then you guys slap each other on the butts afterward. Like, that, that's men loving men. Fair. I mean, look, I think this world still exists. Like, uh, I think there are pl places in America where you can have that experience. Where you could competitively go and wrestle with other guys. And at the end, one of you can score. All right, but it, actually, in all seriousness, uh, what I was bringing—it just perplexes me that, um, as someone who I loosely follow sports, that especially like in the NFL, it would be—it's becoming the less popular of like the, the national sports. Why you literally have a billionaire superstar, world superstar, that is bringing attention to your league and men's. It, like the most diehard men's immediate response is, oh, she's just doing it for publicity. She's just fucking um. How? Why? Where is the p pessimism coming from? Why can't you take that as a win? Well, there is something to be said about gatekeeping a hobby or a uh, a thing to to keep it um as it is. When you have sure. an influx of popularity, right, from sources of 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 what they're called tourists in the hobby industry, people who, who come in, they don't really, they're not really involved. They're just looking at it and they start to, to rearrange the furniture in this house that you guys have built. Uh, it can be frustrating and it can be something that isn't pleasant. Um, so I understand the kind of, uh, that kind of mindset, but I think it's counterproductive because yeah. as a, as someone who enjoys a hobby, you should want, there to be new blood into the hobby. You should want there to be an influx of people who hadn't really considered it before, but are now considering it. So it's a there's a tension here, right, between uh, gatekeeping and uh, growing a hobby. I don't know. What are your thoughts here, Brittany? You know, it's it's hard to say because I know when things change, it does feel like something someone's taking something away from you. But I think this is where, you know, compromise is really necessary, which is like the new guard meeting the new or the old guard meeting the new. Sorry. So it's like this is how we used to do it. This is how they want to do it. Where do we compromise and meet in the middle? Or is it OK to also not integrate our communities together and be gatekeepy? I don't think, again, I think it's up to the communities to make that decision. This is why I often don't find myself staying in communities very long because it is true. The change is difficult. But even more than that, um, it's a lot of energy to put into one another. And so I can see there's like a conflict between 
um, the desire to like adapt in that growth. So I, I'm going to say no one's really the bad guy here so much as like people are in conflict with feeling safe and having a space that meant something to them. And when things change, it feels like, hey, that's like one more thing that isn't mine anymore. So we we I'm, grow no. possessive over our communities, you know. I will say this, that uh, I guess I know you were memeing a little bit when you came in, but there is some truth Never. like – Men aren't allowed to have men's only spaces anymore in a real way. It, it I also really I agree it has changed a little bit, but like there still are men's spaces like people can go, but like yeah, they're called le, the like they are labeled ones. as toxic spaces, right? There are there are a lot of people like why aren't you letting women in? There's a lot of that in the Warhammer hobby, which I, I if you guys like a callback to earlier in the show. There's a, a big debate on whether space marines, they should have female space marines, okay? In the lore, this has never been a thing, right? Uh, but for whatever reason, there's a lot of people who really want representation in space marines, okay? Um, I think that's kind of... A, it, it, it does feel like a, an attack, though, because, again, you have this organization, a brotherhood, okay? And... It's, I think, the only, uh, the only race or the only uh, team that is all men. You have all women's teams. You have teams with women in there. But this one, just because this one doesn't have any women, suddenly it's uh, problematic. I don't, I don't know if I agree with that. I think that it's okay to uh, have a men's only space. I think it's fine. Yeah, um, and. I agree. Like, I think there you should maybe allow for like inclusion of women in certain spaces, but it doesn't need to be in all aspects. Um, obviously, like this always goes in the conversation. Red pill love going this. They immediately like to like um, pigeonhole it to violence. Obviously, men have kind of like uh, authority, or not. That's the wrong word, but like. They control the space on violence, whether it's military, those sort of like activities, hobbies. Um, that doesn't mean women aren't capable of the same physical type of activities, but uh, uh, yeah. Any other thoughts on this, Brittany, before we uh, move on? You know, I don't ask for perfection. I just ask for open-mindedness and conflict resolution. And needing something perfect is not going to be the answer. So I, you know, wish the best to communities. But this is always going to, I think, be an issue moving forward, right? That's why mm -hmm. we have factions of different religions and different belief systems and different political groups. Because one little variation and people are making their own communities. Which, hey, maybe that is the answer. Maybe Word. Should, and I, before you send me off, which, there. Um... I, one quite you've been Brittany, you've been bringing up multiple times. Morality is very subjective, which I would agree, and it's personal. But would you agree that like there is a larger society morality def that we kind of collectively defined? It may be kind of nebulous and abstract, but it is a kind of definable area. I definitely think there are like ethics in which societies can agree to and I do think it's cultural and it is a construct so I don't think it's objective but I think if you're going to define objective outside of like space and time or perception versus objective meaning the collective agrees then I think the collective can agree to what they think is objectively we're going to use that word in quotations proper for the ethics of their society um, and I'm okay with that like I live in Croatia it's a Catholic country they have a set of ethics they just recently banned gay marriage fine it's not my favorite thing as a queer person, but you know what? I'm in their territory. I'm in their cultural bubble. I'm not here to make a ruckus. I'm here to enjoy and be grateful that I'm here. So as a society, they have these ethics that I adhere to, even as a queer person, and even though it's a little uncomfortable and awkward. You know what I'm saying? So societies get to make up their own standard. Yeah. Um, would you not push in your personal – you don't have to preach it, obviously, among Croatia, but I'm sure in your personal – interactions in Croatia, you probably try to like open people up to the idea of homosexuality or I or just yeah, like the sexuality spectrum. No, nah, I mind my business. No? You don't? Nope. I uh, have an online. That's what I do online. Like if I'm going to do anything like that, it's going to be online in my personal space. I let people go about their day. 
I think society, you know, the road to hell is paved in good intentions. And I think not enough people mind their own business. You know, online spaces are great to voice those opinions and to change people's minds. But if I'm at the grocery store, if I'm at a fam family gathering, like, you know, I don't really well, not, don't, you know. Yeah, not forcing, but like engaging in a dialogue. Because a lot of times some of like changing people's minds is just like low exposure, repeated exposure to, oh, wow, I've seen two men kiss. That's no longer a foreign thing to me. Yeah, um, you know, I think I can do that without talking about it. I think, you know, sometimes, you know, my mom has three queer kids and her and my father certainly haven't changed their ideas about queer people, right? It's not just about exposure. It's about where that person is coming from. What's their priority? What's the most important thing to them? So I don't fight battles I can't win. I let people live their yeah. lives. But if I in yeah. any way see a curiosity in a person, I maybe might bring it up. But my job is not to like um, change people. My job is to radically learn how to accept people in a philosophy sense, right? Yeah, you don't need to be a, like a proselytizer. Evangelism. Uh, yeah. But Evan think, there you go. Yeah, but content creation is a great space for that, right? I practice it every day by mm -hmm. having these conversations with Wick and you guys. Thank you for calling in, my alibi. Uh, Bye. Hey, guys. A nice guy. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I uh, I guess to the, the the point though. I think if I wanted to have a server where it was no women, only men, I should be able to make that. Do it, and that should be okay, right? I think so. No one should, no one should cry foul. Sure. I get to decide who is in my community and who is not. Now, if we're talking about like a business, like if we're talking like a grocery store, or if we're talking like a Something like that, different story, right? Mm -hmm. But when it when it comes to things like a church, even right, I think churches, if they don't want non-members in their church, they should be able to say, no, if you're not a member of the church, you you're not allowed in this church. Um, I think that's perfectly acceptable to do. I think that people should have the ability with their own sphere of influence to make their own rules to an extent. Yeah, um, I'm okay with that. Okay, great. Oh my gosh, I've never called into a stream before this is crazy i so hope we'll fun. be judging for your first time but go on. <laughs> i guess we're about to find out um so Brittany, i have a question for you i love your content first Thank of you. all Thank um you. but i think maybe we disagree just a little bit on a certain topic but maybe not we'll see we'll have to unpack it um, but I've heard you talk a lot recently about how you feel like maybe a lot of people or maybe even most people should not be having kids. Um, and I'm kind of I totally get where you're coming from, but I'm also sort of sensitive to this idea of categorically saying that people are not capable of having kids and doing a good job with it, even though obviously a lot of people don't do a good job of it. So I don't know. I just could you unpack that for me a little bit, like more of your thought process behind that? Yeah, for sure. Especially since I have a tendency to also be like super hyperbolic. I will say. Fair. I mean, it's kids. It's an emotional topic. Oh, so for sure. I, look, ultimately, I do think we're animals evolved over time. I don't know that for a fact, but I think we're like living organisms on the planet. And I don't think we're obligated to procreate. But if you find yourself procreating, I think it would be great if you would do the research and to harm reduction in relation to having those children, but it's not going to be perfect. So I think the way I look at it when I say like people shouldn't have kids is I don't really mean it. Like I'm not a natalist, right? Like I don't, or anti-natalist. Right, I right, don't right. actually think people shouldn't have children. What I think is like, if you're going to bring a consciousness into the world, understand how powerful of a decision that is. But also like if people don't, like I also don't have an attachment to people actually thinking about it before they do it since they don't seem to. I think it's more or less me being a little bit like uh, poke the bear to get people to think like, why does she think that? So we can have a conversation like I know from my partner and I, every time we think about procreating, we don't reach our own standards of requirements to be parents. And so we're probably deciding not to have standards? our, I'm sorry. What are those standards? Out of curiosity? Oh, uh, they're a little private, but it's hard to say out loud because there's a list oh. of them. But ultimately it's how, like, it's one thing to get pregnant and then do the best you can do. And it's one thing to, like with intention have a child and we just have financial standards we'd like to reach access standards also we'd want to be 100 percent sure i think um that's really like a huge requirement and i've recently had a trans like 
transition or trans like I just had a change after my diagnosis with fibro that has led me to like losing my desire to be a mother which has never happened my whole life I wanted like seven babies um so that's new for me and I'm like learning to accept that I don't seem to have the desire and so it'd be kind of silly to have a baby just to have it you know what I mean and I think a lot of people do that I think a lot of people have babies because it like hits a checklist like buying a home and I just think babies are a little bit more important in terms of uh, just doing it for a checklist. So that's really what I mean by it. It's not that I don't think people should have babies. I just think most people who have babies um, are probably not great parents, but they're not evil people. And I, I need this to be heard. I love my parents. I think they're really, really good people. They weren't the greatest parents, but they weren't the worst parents. They were parents. They were people in the 80s who fell in love and had a bunch of babies and didn't think about all the individual uniqueness of all those babies, right? Which doesn't make them evil. It just makes them people, you know? So I just want to say that out loud because yeah. I know this is sensitive, you know? Right. So so what I'm hearing you say is that you feel like people are just approaching procreation like way too flippantly, not thinking it through beforehand, not like considering like the weight of it and how serious it is and questioning whether or not they're ready before they do it. They're just like, eh, it's a thing we do. Let's go for it. Is that what I'm hearing you say? For sure. And I also, I don't have the expectation that they'll do any better than that when they don't even know why they like their favorite foods or their favorite shows or why they're even choosing their career. I don't expect yeah. them to then have the introspection, introspection journey, extrospection journey to be like, why am I having a kid? I just know people are doing things because they think they should or they think it's natural mm -hmm. or they listen to these red pillars say like, every man wants to procreate and have a baby <laughs> and spawn. And it's right. like, I yeah. guess, like, I don't know what that means, but I guess. It's also... But not true. I feel like lots of people don't want kids, but okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I, a I, new movement, by the way. And I love that. But you see how they do you have you seen the TikToks where they fight about it and they moralize it at each other? Like you're a bad person for wanting kids. You're a bad person for not wanting kids. And I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. You're it's just so people. wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's such an individual choice. And like it really is. and you know, okay, so so that's very helpful. It's a helpful clarification. Um Can I ask you a question, it, dear caller? Yeah, sure. Um, Go for it. I mean. Um do you think that there are any like standards for having kids that you would think should be applied? And I'm talking about metrics like income levels. Uh, do you think that there should be like a minimum income level that people should meet before they think about having children? Uh, okay. So it's interesting you bring that up personally. Uh, okay. I'm going to say no, but here's the nuance here. Obviously, it is way more ideal if you make enough money to provide a comfortable life for your child. And obviously like your child's life is going to be better if you make good money. And by the way, like, I'll just say this, I'm saying that as a person who does not make good money and I have children. So like, I fully understand all the huge disadvantages that come with trying to raise children when you don't have a lot of money and maybe can't give them everything you would want to give them. Um, and like, if I could go back, I would love to have been in a better financial situation before I had kids. Um, and, and by the way, like, if you push back on me, I'm not going to take it personally. Like, I totally get the Fair arguments enough. regarding this. I'm not like, a... I'm not, I'm not so much saying, like, when, when I say minimum income level, I'm not talking about, like, oh, I can't give all my kids um, everything they want. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, like, if, if a couple is struggling to feed themselves, right, to house themselves, to um, live without kids, right, if they are struggling at that level where they are relying on subsidies, they're relying on other maybe a, a family member to help them out or something i don't i don't know if in that that situation i think that it would be wrong of them to have kids on purpose right um, i think, I think that it's wrong i just think it's it's mm. unideal right it's just going to be harder but like especially the thing too like maybe you live in a community where the people around you are okay with helping you out so that you can raise children. Like there are lots of, there are lots of churches like that. There are lots of families like that, that are like, yeah, you can live with the grandparents and like, we'll help you guys out and go ahead and have your babies. Like, it, it just so depends. Like, I understand what you're saying that like, but in, let's be real in the United States of America, it's very unusual for people to be starving. Right. Like, even if you're very poor. Yes. Like, because obviously that's an extreme. People, for example, 
Um, not, I want it's still a small, insignificant like portion. There's still a, a very small percentage comparatively, but that is what I'm talking about here in these educations. If you are a homeless person, right? I don't think you should be having kids. I don't know if that's. I a, just want to. Can we clarify? Like, I never want to have the legal argument about the government ever coming in and telling people. No, I'm not to talking about bodies. the government. Should, I'm not. So I'm, if oh, we're no, having no, no, a moral no, 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 conversation. Right? Yes, I'm then I agree about, with Wick on yeah, this, that in yeah. my morals, when I look at my values, I don't think you should be having babies if you're poor or if you're homeless. I don't think you should be having babies. I'm going to say poor because I don't know what that means in terms of income around the world. But I do think there's 400,000 children in foster care in the United States alone. I think there are babies around the world whose parents give them up for adoption because they can't feed them, not because they don't want them. I think around the world, people aren't learning about safe sex or birth control because of religious institutions or influence. I think we're talking about a world that doesn't have access to these things. My birth control costs $1,200. That's pretty expensive. You know, and everyone can put up $1,200 to get birth control. You know, I got it without insurance. I paid for it in cash. That's I made that decision. You know, um, my husband and I are pro-choice. So like we're not opposed to ending the life of that child if we feel like it's necessary. We're open to making decisions we think is best in the long run, harm reduction, not perfection. So obviously, like in a moral sense, in a, in a perfect world where people could plan out their pregnancies, you wouldn't have a child if you couldn't financially provide for them. And at the same time, because we're animals evolved over time, it doesn't matter if your spawn makes it to 18. So if you want to make that decision to put your child's life at risk or their education at risk or their development at risk because you want to make love and have a baby, absolutely. Thoughts, dear viewer? Yeah, I just, I, I feel a little, because here's the thing. If there's a person, and this is pretty typical, like if you're a person in the United States, let's say you make $30,000 a year, which is not very much money, like a lot of people will only make $30,000 their whole life because there's like income mobility is there, but like it's, there's a lot of challenges, right? So like going from one income bracket to another, like, sure. do you think that everyone who makes $30,000 a year, it's morally wrong for them to be having children? I think you could, you could do fine on 30,000 a year. Um, like you got, like, if you're not in a city, obviously, but if you're living in the country, yeah, you could do you could do fine on thirty thousand. Yeah, I think um what? because people aren't entitled to children, just like you're not entitled to sex. I think that's how I view having children. I think thinking you're entitled to them is the wrong way to think about it because that's not your life. That's someone else's you're making and forcing them into existence. So it's not about thirty thousand a year, right? Because it's like cultural. What is thirty thousand in Kentucky? What is thirty thousand in California? And it's about your community but also you know it's about you as an individual acknowledging you are creating a new consciousness and then you are forcing them into existence and then you're saying to them okay this is the life I've brought you into and if you can live with the life you've brought them into that's great but my moral standard wouldn't justify me bringing a kid into the situation I'm in right now though one thing will trump that and that is my desire to not have an abortion. So unless my child's health is at risk or my own, I would struggle at this point in my life to have an abortion. So if I get pregnant, I would probably do everything possible to make that life good for that baby. But I will tell you this right now, my quality of life will go down if I have a baby right now. And that would be very frustrating to me since I work so hard to just have this quality of life. It would frustrate me to ha have to downgrade for a child. And I think it'd be unfair to the child. And so I would yeah. feel, you know, in conflict there. No, I actually, okay, so I appreciate what you just said, because you just said your quality of life would go down well, if you the had child, a child right course. now. Yeah. Well, I think that there, I think that frequently when you have kids, like, part of the decision that you have to make if you're a good parent is that you're going to, within reason, prioritize the well-being of the child, like, above yourself, because, uh, like you've been saying, you brought them into the world. That was your choice. You did that. They didn't choose to be here. So, I do think that you do have a moral responsibility to prioritize the well-being of the child. And like, there's so much that you can do regardless of your sort of outside circumstances. Like when you have a baby to go like, okay, I have this baby, the circumstances in my life may be unideal. What am I going to do to work as hard as I can to try to give this child a good life, regardless of what my circumstances are? Like, I, I really think that people can do that. And like a big example for me that I care about a lot is uh, disabled people. 
because that's my community. And a lot of people feel like people with disabilities categorically should not be having children um, and that people with disabilities should categorically have their children taken away from them. And like there's some very extreme beliefs around this and the court systems are not very nice to people with disabilities who have kids. Um, and so I, I, I just sort of I care a lot about categorically saying like this type of person should not be having kids because I really feel like being a good parent it has so much more to do with like your own emotional maturity and your own willingness to sacrifice for your kid um, and your own willingness to just prioritize them regardless of your life circumstances and your willingness to kind of adapt and Fine. say, if I'm not doing, if I cannot give this kid the quality of life on my own, like who can I bring around me to help me get there, to like help me out? Like, like maybe, uh, maybe I would need like a family member or a friend mm -hmm. to, uh, help me raise this child depending on the circumstance right sometimes the sacrifice we make is not having the kid sometimes the mature response the mature sacrifice is the desire that we have to have the child um if you are in a situation we got to be real about this if you are in a situation where you cannot support a child you should not burden those around you the government society by having that child just because you want one there are things that i want that it would be wrong for me just to take, right? It would be wrong. I would be immoral to, I want this, so I'm gonna have it, right? I don't care what it's gonna cost those around me. That's a very selfish way of looking at things. So I understand that society should try to make it so that everyone who wants kids can have kids, but the reality we are in is that not everyone who wants kids should should have kids. It's just, that's that's how it is. Or, and to your point, I think you're right that people are amazing and humans in survival situations will overcome. And I'm 1000% in agreement with that. I think in an ideal situation, this is why, where I try to figure out my morals, right? Because again, I'm not going to judge anybody in a survival situation who's doing the best they can if they don't have the education or knowledge. But if you have the education and knowledge, why would you on purpose bring a disabled child into the world in a sense like if you know you have a – like there was a person at a church I, I used to visit with a friend that their genetics would make it so every male baby – they had about five at the time – had a severe disability, nonverbal, wheelchair bound, and every boy would have this. And they had two girls, so seven kids total, and those kids would outlive their parents. I think it is morally irresponsible to continue continue having kids when you know they're going to not only survive you, but they're going to need care that you can't afford to ever make in your lifetime. So to support those children, right? I'm pro look, I'm like, I don't think disabled babies are less of baby than non-disabled babies. All babies are beautiful babies. I love babies. But I do think that before this baby comes into existence, you have the power to make a decision that I think is more morally correct. So if I found out I was tested and all my babies would have severe disabilities, I probably would make the decision to sterilize myself personally. But I understand that's a very hard and personal conversation to have. So please do not hear me and think I'm saying that people with disabilities are less than people without disabilities. I, you know, in a world where we're all neurodivergent apparently or chronically ill or <laughs> sick, I'm not about to throw yeah. stones about who's worthy of existing. But I, I do want to say like with love and compassion that I'm trying to say before that baby is even conceived, I would like to make that decision for that baby. You know what I'm saying? So I again, I props to you and your communities and people that overcome their situations. I think my parents did that. You know, I think our our ancestors did that. I just want to maybe be making a non-survival decision when it comes to my child. Anything else, dear viewers? Is that okay? I just, I really want to like just human to human right now because I feel like this is a very heavy topic. Are you okay? Oh, yeah. No, no. I mean, I obviously like, I knew that I was jumping into a heavy topic when I brought it okay. up because it's kids. And, you know, yeah. I at, look at, at the end of the day, I, I believe that both you and I care about the well being of children and the people who are having them. Right. Um, and, Honestly, we probably agree more than we disagree. Um, yeah, I would I, say so. I, 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 think, I think it's probably just about like where we draw the lines in terms of like where and how we moralize it. But yes. yeah. yeah, but no, but I, I, I appreciate the conversation. Yeah, same, Thank you same. For calling in. Thank you for calling in. See you later. Okay, we got one more and then we're going to end this shit show. Okay, one more. 
And we're it's been a great, a great shit show. It has. I've enjoyed it. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm well. I've got a couple of quick notes. Hi, Britt. Long time no see. Hello. This is mostly me here to roast you guys a little, and then I'm roasting Wick. So first of all, the alien analogy earlier, I'm very disappointed in both of you. We do not value goodness in aliens. We value goodness in human beings. Fuck them aliens. You only get to pick one. The trolley example I also think is pretty easy. Like, if it's like my mom versus 100 strangers, bye mom. Sorry. What? No way, bro. Yeah. Bye 100 strangers. I don't know you, bitch. Nah, no, nah, no. Nah, that's just the way to go. And then, that's wild, Wick, bro. <laughs> Wick, we got to talk about cake. Listen, I've been holding this one because I, I, I wasn't I wasn't in a place where I was streaming when you had this panel. But we got to talk about cake. OK. What the fuck kind of take? First of all, your cake that you want is for children. The American flag, blueberry straw. It's for children. My cake, my rules. Is for fucking children. Second of all. I want a child's cake. I will get a child's cake. And if you don't get, if I, here, let me, let me elaborate for those of you who don't know what he's talking about. Okay. There was a uh, Reddit post made about a man whose wife baked him a cake. Was correct. Okay. <gasps> I let know me, this story. Me, was correct. He didn't, she didn't do it to, to perfect, did she? She added vanilla. No, he's, his, a, he's, he's a bastard. Is That's this what the, the vanilla one? Is. is this the vanilla yes. story? Yes. I'm on the husband's side. Yes. Yes. Oh, As my you God. You guys are so if wrong. You, you look, are so wrong. If you say, hey, I want this type of cake, and you're very specific with what you want, and then if it's for your birthday, and then they give you something that is other than what you want, they don't respect you as a person. Like, oh straight up. Oh my god, over cake? No. Especially, for the record, your cake. Don't even start. We'll stick with chocolate and vanilla because that's actually something I can have no, a conversation I, with. I'm, I'm, I'm being real with you. Were to say, every year for my birthday, you, hey, shut, shut up. 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 Every year for my birthday, every year for my birthday, I want an American flag cake, okay? I want one that has, um, White icing no. for the white stripes, blueberry, either icing or actual blueberries for the blue stripes. I, I'm I'm flexible on this, right? And, there's no and blue stripes on the American flag. This is a weird cake. For the red stripes, okay? Well, there's no blue stripes. There's blue star field thing, right? Um, And guess what? Every time I've asked someone in my life to give this tape for me, whether it be a partner or a spouse or a parent or a, a, you know, a family member, they've given me that cake. They've made okay. the cake for me. And there but wasn't a big didn't. deal with it, right? But if they if didn't, I had asked them, really be if I had asked them for an American flag cake and then they gave me a Chinese cake or something, that would have been a, a Chinese cake. Serious a Chinese flag cake? Chinese flag. Yeah, with red and like... Okay, I, okay, okay, I want different. in on this. I want in on this. Little, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, obviously, because my Discord had the most heated debate over this fucking Reddit post, let me tell you. So I will tell you this, okay? Obviously, show gratitude. Don't be a little bitch about it. But... When you ask Thank me, you. when you ask me, love of my life, what can I get you? And I say, oh, my God, I'm such a specific eater. I'm so neurodivergent. I thank you for asking. Can I have this specific cake? Because if it's any other cake, I won't be able to eat it. Literally, I will gag. And then they get me the cake that makes me gag. I will then wonder, oh, my God, do you fucking hate me, bro? Like, do you well, not love me? Though, right? Like, do you – like – be honest about how many qualifiers you had there. They're like, oh my God, Fine. thank you so much. I'm neurodivergent. I'll like, I won't like it. Like this guy was just like, yeah, I prefer chocolate. She put well, a fucking I layer think, of vanilla I in. I think the dilemma is that we're all putting our own emphasis on how the story is told. So obviously from my perspective, like I, when I, because again, if she hadn't asked him and she had just attempted to make something, then be grateful and eat it or whatever you want to do. But since she asked, it feels weird to ask and then not do it right. It feels weird. Like, why do you ask? It's or why didn't weird. you warn him? Let's use the right I think, word I think here. There's something weird about it. I don't think it's disrespectful. That's crazy. It this is person, possibly this person disrespectful. You, this person, um, yeah, if they did it with intent. If they, well, obviously, the if they were trying, if they were trying, it would be intentionally like, it's neglect. just because neglect. That's the problem. Is like, are you the kind uh, of person so that doesn't. I think my partner and I, look, we when we say, I want to do life with you, you're asking this person to combine an existence together that needs to be. I think you should pay attention to small details and I think you should be more than thoughtful because again, like 
What are we doing? So again, I'm not saying she's evil. I'm saying that those two people shouldn't be together because I think that they're probably ill-matched. I think there are a lot of people that were more than okay with the mistake. But for me, I'm like, ooh, I've like, why'd you ask me then? Because it feels neglectful and I don't want to be neglected because that's kind ooh. of m rude, right? You t you just kind of led me to something. Y yes, but may well, in, in your circumstance, yes. But what if, okay. What if people who like wouldn't give a fuck should be with other people who wouldn't give a fuck? Yes, absolutely. That's exactly it. That's what should so, happen. Like, normal people who wouldn't give a fuck <laughs> should be with the wife and you fucking wild what people are who are working about? up over your cakes so can I think date that's each the other. Dilemma, right? We're moralizing it. And I'm saying for me, it feels it would be. So my partner and I have things that we consider abuse in the relationship and neglect is one of them. Like he doesn't like loud noises. I don't like overstimulation. If we start doing that to each other, there's going to be a question of like, are you abusing me on purpose now? Because like, you know, I don't like that. So why are you doing it? Because like, if you know somebody, why would you do that to them? And there is some people that will use it as an excuse, right? To basically, that's the problem is like good intentions, bad intentions. I don't know this woman's intentions, but I think the man has the right to feel a little fucking butthurt that she asked yeah. and then didn't even deliver. Like Absolutely. he can't even feel butthurt. Like yeah, that's so let's, weird. Let's, let's. Again, let's really dig reaction, out. Right? Not, let's really his dig reaction was silly, this. but her, she, I feel like made a huge mistake that I could have, maybe in my mind is just huge, but like she could have said something. She could have warned him. She could have said, I'm so sorry. I couldn't get everything you wanted. So I made it a little different. I hope that's okay. And then he would have been like, oh, for sure, bro. Like it's a bummer, but like, is it okay if I mad at him. Well, they she both got, got mad, mad at each at other, him. right? They both got mad at each other. She stormed mm -hmm. off. He felt disappointed and whined, right? Is that the story, if I remember it correctly? Yeah, he well, he well, he whined is a weird word to use. He, he pouted because like, he, he ate, ate around cake, it. First of all, he ate around he the vanilla, right? Yeah, he ate it. He ate around the vanilla, but he ate it. He when she asked, Hey, you don't like your cake? He told her the answer. No, I wanted this. I told you this. And you got me something different. Like, there's only a couple uh, ways this could have gone. Either one, she just didn't listen to what he had, didn't really care about what he wanted and just did her own thing anyway. Or it was a purposeful kind of backhanded kind of thing, like a little passive aggressive bitchiness, if you will. Um, or she forgot, right? Like, she, there's an honest forgetfulness and she just oopsied. Uh, those are the three possibilities here. But, like, the fact, the way she responded after is even worse, right? To make it about her. It's his birthday. Let him have his cake on his birthday the way he wants it. She can have her cake on her day the way she wants it, okay? But don't get mad at me if you ask me, hey, this thing I got for you, right? Um, are you happy with it? And if I'm not happy with it, I'll tell you I'm not happy with it. Because look, right? it's like sometimes it's a thought that matters. And sometimes at a certain point, if you're a grown adult, if you're not like my uh, my husband has a specific snack he really likes. He likes one, like a certain variation of it. If I go to the store and get him always the kind he doesn't love, eventually that's fucking abusive, bro. Because eventually I'm purposely saying, but I got you a snack. But I got you a snack. It's like, it's not even a snack he likes. Why are you even spending money on it? So again, she could have been malicious or she could have been making a mistake. But I think the dilemma here is that they didn't have the communication skills to even say to one another, like what their intentions were. They both blew up at each other. It was obviously not a good relationship, right? Because a good relationship would have had that conversation and been like, hey, why did you make the cake different? And then she would have said, oh, I'm, I was out of product and I had to put vanilla in it. Or, oh, but it was the idea that he should have just liked it. And she like, and she should have done better. It's like something went terribly wrong here. It's not really about the cake, if, is it? Yeah, if you get a present for someone and you are so concerned about their reception of the present, like, that's not why you should be getting a present for someone. If I get a present for someone, it's to make them feel good. Right. And if I fail at that, that's on me. It's not on them. Yeah, I just think there wasn't enough like understanding from – there was something – it's not about the cake. Something went wrong, right? Like I don't get gifts for people unless I know for a Wait fact a it will be, yeah, specific to them. Mm-hmm. So you just said when I try to get a gift for someone, it's to make them feel good. Shouldn't it just stop there? Like you're being thoughtful as hell already. Thoughtful is not good enough, bro. Your parents are thoughtful when they beat you, aren't they? They're like have good intentions for you. People have good intentions. It doesn't mean it's good enough, right? Like your good intentions aren't good enough in my opinion. But some people think it's good enough. I just don't. No gold Why stars. Why do you like beating people with cake? Well, well, Relax. You know. Yeah, that – 
that escalated but, so rapidly, like, and I don't think my dad had thoughtful, good intentions when he beat the fuck out of me. So, just oh, uh, my parents definitely did. My parents definitely yeah. did, right? Yeah, like, I, don't, I don't think so. My dad, my dad was not like, "I'm. This is. I'm gonna be better for him." In the end, he was just yeah. having a good time. Okay, so like even with the cake thing, it's like I had a good intention for you, but that's the thing is like your good intentions sometimes aren't as thoughtful, and like not being thoughtful, I think, isn't always excusable. I'm just saying, if my partner, right, came up to me and says, hey, I want to go see this movie. I want to go see, I want to go see, um, I don't know, Terminator, okay? And then I take her to go see uh, The Notebook. And then she gets mad at me. Like, why did you tell me? Like, and then I turn around and say, but I took you to a movie. You should just be grateful. That would be fucked up, wouldn't it? Right? Like, it'd be weird of me to do. It'd be weird. Like, if you tell know, me, hey, man. I want to see this movie. Okay, no, just take it to another dessert factor. Hey, I want a specifically a Snickers. Can I have a Snickers for my birthday? Yeah, absolutely. And they got me a Twix. It's like, why would you get me a Twix? Don't you think it's weird? Yeah, I don't know. I guess this. Like, what would be the reason? That's what I'm saying. Like, what would be her reasoning for getting something he didn't ask for? What if they didn't have a Snickers? Okay, but then she would say, hey, they didn't yeah, have a I Snickers. Don't have a Snickers. Sorry. Yeah. Like, I'm That's so like sorry. Like, here's something else. Is that okay? But, like, the, again, we don't know the real details of the story. But the idea is just like, hey, that would be really weird for my – my partner would not do this to me. He would get me exactly what I wanted or he would say I can't get you exactly what – he would warn me. Because it's like, yeah, like, I don't – because sometimes people give gifts just for themselves. They don't give it for the person. You know what I'm saying? You know those people in your life who only give you gifts so they can get the good feeling. It's not even about you. It's like, yes. girl, I don't even want your gift then. That's what a little bit what it sounded like to me when I read it originally. Where I was like, girl, this is, she's making it about her and that's annoying to me. Okay. Can we get back to how Wick's cake is for children and that's a ridiculous ass? Wick, we're all going to die. Enjoy your cake. Thank you. <laughs> Five parallax. My cake is not for kids. It's for me. I want the cake I want, and you're not going to shame me because it's a flag cake. I like exactly. the flag cake. USA, inside and out. I like to consume it. Okay? No, it's just a tradition. I want cake. I don't know why it feels good to me. It just feels good to get it every year. Yeah. And so, I don't know. You know, Wick, I'm very sensitive to cake, actually. I'm very sensitive to its texture. It has to be like a red velvet or a deep chocolate mud cake. It has to be a thick cake. Anything that's like too fluffy or a carrot cake. But if it's like a regular white cake, I'm not eating it. I love you. Thank you for the intention. I can't. Noted if I ever in a situation where I'm getting you cake. I'm just saying, um, like, please if, you, remind me. if you give a gift to somebody, it should be about the person who's receiving it, not yes. you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So many people made this. It, it did. It uh, the great chalky cake civil war in my community, too. It was um, a lot. Yeah. And, and the lines really got drawn between people who were upset that, uh, hypothetically the person they got through their gift uh the gift for were rude to them mm -hmm. and then there was the people who were like yo um if you were going to give a gift to someone make it the what they want right so it, it really i i know i'm biased in this but the people who are selfish versus the people who are selfless but that's me i don't want to reignite this gang <laughs> it's been a fun discussion it's been a fun great Talk. Thank you, Brittany, Thank for you. coming. Is there anything you want to share before we uh, before we adjourn? Uh, don't be entitled, whether it's about cake or people's bodies. Based. Okay, yeah. Brittany, thank you thank again. Thank you, Wick. Talk, talk to you soon. Bye. So wait, okay, just to talk about this cake thing, let me tell you. Again, it's about entitlement. Don't feel entitled and be very thoughtful. You know, people make mistakes. Don't be cruel to people who try to give you gifts. One time I gave my mom a gift and she rejected it. And I cried. And then I thought to myself, you know, if I just thought about my mom a little harder and I was more thoughtful, I would have recognized it was the wrong gift to give her. And that took a lot of intimacy uh, and vulnerability for us to both say to each other, thank you so much for getting me this gift. I can't accept it. And for me to say, even though that hurts my feelings immensely and I'm going to cry over it, I also radically accept that I did not think of you enough to understand this wouldn't have been a good gift for you because it wasn't. And I think that that is a very difficult conversation and realization to have with people you love. Because genuinely, if I had just thought about my mom 10% more than I thought about myself getting the gift, I would have known it wasn't the right gift. I'll tell you what it was. Lex says, what was the gift? So I, my mom and I love the story of Ruth. 
And we share a connection with this movie. I'm actually going to show it in February on the Discord because it's one of my favorite romantic stories. And for Valentine's Day, I thought we'd do like a little rom-com Christian style just because I grew up with it and it's a really good story and everyone in the movie's hot. So it works. And I got my mom this modern kind of magazine you put on your table that looks like a magazine. But if you read it, it's like Bible verses. And it was the story of Ruth. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I didn't research the company dumb. I knew they weren't Catholic, but I forgot that like that matters. So they were Protestant, I think, or Christian or whatever. I get my mom this gift and she opens it up and she looks at it. And right away, like my brothers and sisters start looking through the pages and everyone's looking at it. And my dad's sitting here thinking like, oh, that's very thoughtful. But my mom, I see it on her face right away. She's not happy. And I was like, what did I do? And then I realized like, I don't know why I thought buying a fucking book by a Protestant who's anti-Catholic and Catholics and Protestants are not friends would make my mom happy that I gave my money to people that are anti-Catholic, right? It's like, why did I do that, right? It's because I saw this book and I thought of how we connected to it, but I didn't think about my mom. My mom wants me to support Catholic communities if I buy her something Catholic, buy it from a Catholic. And I didn't do that. So the story was very modern. The pictures and art they used in it was not Catholic. It was very modern. It was weird. Like I wasn't even a fan of it because I didn't even get to see the book before I bought it. I just kind of bought it. I didn't get to see what was in it. It was not a vibe. And I, I, my mom's very traditional. She likes traditional art. So my mom pulls me aside and goes, Betsy, I can't accept this gift. And I go, you know, I know that and it hurts my feelings. But I also know if I had thought about you, 10% more than I thought about myself, I wouldn't have gotten you this gift. But I was thinking about myself. I was. I was thinking, I love this story with her and we could share this connection. But I wasn't going the extra step to think my mom wouldn't want me to buy her something that wasn't from a Catholic organization or like, um, like, like something, organization, something, Catholic something. So, okay. So I took it back and I think I just gave it to Goodwill. I don't even know what I did with it. But note to self, because my mom is an excellent gift giver. My mom is so good at giving gifts. She she's really thoughtful about when she gives gifts. And so my mom, you know, the gift she loves the most is a surprise. The best gift I can always give my mom is a surprise. I don't even need to buy her things. My mom gets a kick out of when her kids just show up to her house with no like warning. She thinks it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to her. She just loves it. So my parents have an open door policy with their kids. We can show up to our parents' house any time of day, in middle of the night, doesn't matter, no rules. My parents give us all the door codes. We are allowed in their home 24-7. Someone is always living with my parents. Like, they have 10 kids. So my parents, because they have this open door policy, the best gift to give my mom is a surprise. So, okay. So that is an example of, like, she's right. I wasn't thinking about her fully. I was thinking about myself. And I got her this gift that I thought would be cool, but it wasn't a good gift to my mother. The best gift I can give my mom is a surprise. So I'm sure I will do it soon where I'll probably like fly all the way from Croatia to visit her without telling her. I'll probably tell everyone else. Like I'll tell my dad, like I'm going to come surprise mom. I'm coming to California. And that will probably be the big surprise because she would never see it coming, which would be so fun. Right? Um... But like, that's my mom, right? And I need to recognize like, she is a unique consciousness and she has specific wants and desires. And as a good daughter, it is my job to think about her. And yes, she could have accepted the gift because the thought is what counts. But in this situation, it's not. You know what I mean? I wasn't thinking of her. I was thinking of her partially, but mostly I was thinking about myself. I made a mistake. And I think it was better for my mom to tell me she couldn't accept the gift than to accept it. But also. Uh, she also accepted that it would hurt my feelings and she let me cry and she gave me a hug. This happened two years ago. This is recent. This just happened. Not this last Christmas, but the Christmas before. This is recent. It's nice being with people who can tell you, I love you. I can't accept this gift. And for me to say, okay, I can understand that because it's not coming from an entitled place. My mom isn't being entitled. She's being honest in a way that is more than valid, you know? So again, when it comes to the cake dilemma, don't be entitled, but be thoughtful and be ready for people to not understand the intention of your gift because often gift giving can be ill-intentioned in a world that is so about self-serving, you know, in a negative way. 
Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, says it's like if someone bought you a gift from an anti-gay company. Exactly. Which, yeah, it would be like very unthoughtful, right? It'd be like, why are you doing this? You know? Anyways, um, yeah, so for us, like we're not much of a gift giving family, but if we do give gifts, we try to give gifts that like, oh, that would really, oh, they'd really like this. Oh, they'd really like this. You know, we try to be very, very sure. In my head, in real life, I'm in bed. My belly's being fed, and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah. Da, 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 da.